I'm going to start today by uttering a sentence that would have sounded absolutely ridiculous just two or three years ago. Are we heading for war with China? Again, it it sounds crazy. It does. But looking back at what's happened in the world in this foul decade that is the 2020s, nothing is crazy anymore and everything is. Part of the problem, I guess, is that we don't teach history anymore. We don't value history anymore. And because we don't value it, we don't learn from it. We've collectively forgotten what happened last time we faced a deeply authoritarian, rapidly industrializing, highly militarized rogue state hell bent on territorial expansion at a time when liberal democracies were at their weakest, buckling under the weight of political polarization, racial and sectarian tensions and economic vulnerability. We don't see the parallels between Hitler marching into Poland and Xi Jinping closing in on Taiwan. Taiwan, the true Republic of China, which for over 70 years has been a beacon of freedom, democracy and free market capitalism to the world. Still not convinced? Well, let's recapitulate the events of this last week. At At the start of the week, it was reported that Home Affairs Secretary Mike Pizzullo, one of Australia's most senior public servants, warned in an Anzac Day address to staff that the, quote, drums of war are beating. Then on Tuesday, a senior Chinese military general openly discussed having a good fight with Australia over Taiwan. And then on Wednesday, the Prime Minister announced sweeping upgrades of military bases in northern Australia aimed at defending the Indo-Pacific. And we all know what that means. Now, as you may have noticed, we have a go at Scott Morrison a lot on this show, but there is one sense in which we are behind the Prime Minister and the Morrison government 100%. And that is the tough but necessary stance it has taken on standing up to the Chinese Communist Party and asserting Australia's sovereignty. And one man has been wise to the threat of China since the day he first graced the Australian Senate. And that man is IPA alumnus and chair of the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Intelligence and Security, Senator James Patterson. Let's hear from him now. Senator, how are you? I'm very well, my friend. It's great to join you on your new program. It is absolutely great to have you. It's been a long time coming, but we have to talk about serious business. These are very, very serious times. These times throw up great geopolitical uh, issues. So let's start with an easy one. Uh, when will be when will we be at war with China over Taiwan? Hopefully never, Gideon. Uh, but we have to make sure we do everything we can to prepare for that and other eventualities because the Indo-Pacific region is much less stable than it once was. And the reason why it's less stable than it once was is that rising powers like China are trying to change the order. They're trying mm-hmm. to undermine the rules-based order, yeah. which we have prospered from so much in the post-war era, and they're trying to rewrite it in their favour. And their militarization of the South China Sea in particular is a very bad signal about their future intent, as are their threats towards the people of Taiwan, as are the incursions of PLA uh, assets, including uh, many, many flights into the uh, air zone of the Taiwanese people. Um, It is very concerning. We're certainly not something that we seek or encourage. In fact, something we seek to deter. You're absolutely right. And it's not a matter of will we be at war with China to me. To me, it seems like we are in a kind of quasi-Cold War, and that war is being fought in terms of trade, it's being fought in terms of cybersecurity and espionage. So what's the day-to-day threat to Australians from a from China seeking to overturn the rules-based order in, in the way you've described? My predecessor as chair of this committee, Andrew Hasty, wrote mm. a really important article a couple of years ago where he talked about the fact that in the West we view as peace and war as really distinct concepts and we're either in peace or in war. But in a lot of other cultures and in a Leninist political culture that dominates the Chinese Communist Party, there is a big grey zone between peace and war where lots of things are acceptable in their eternal struggle uh, for power and against the West uh, that we would never even conceive of or uh, consent to in the West. So that includes things like massive cyber intrusions and attacks on countries that you have otherwise friendly relationships with uh, and a free trading relationship with. Uh, It includes things like covert foreign interference in other countries' political debates to try and constrain their choices and to point their policy in a direction that is more pro-Beijing. And it includes uh, things like uh, infiltration and interference on our universities, in our business community, uh, again, to try and seek to influence our public debate and seek to dictate the choices to us that we would not otherwise make for ourselves. So we need to wake up to that. Mm. And the good news is I think we're in a much stronger position than we were five years ago. And a lot of good things have happened that made ourselves 
much more resilient and much more hardened to these threats, but they're not going away anytime soon. And there is more that we need to do to safeguard our sovereignty and our democracy and our freedom. It's, it's a difficult one for me and for you as well. I mean, you and I are both freedom lovers. We both support free speech and, and the right to ventilate opinions and, and positions that may not be popular and may be a little bit subversive. We have to own up or recognise at some point, though, that that is a, a weakness. So how then do you, how do you avert that sort of soft power that you were describing without some sort of neo mccarthyist type uh, mm. paranoia? It's a great question, Gideon, because authoritarian societies often try and use open societies and free societies' own inherent yeah. virtues against us as weaknesses. I think the fact that we have free speech and free debate and competing contests of ideas is a very healthy thing. But an authoritarian political system looks at that and sees that as a weakness and sees that as an opportunity to drive a wedge between us, mm. uh, to divide us from each other, to weaken us internally, because we all know a divided society is a weakened society and it doesn't have the same capacity to respond. So what can we do that's consistent with our values to protect us against that? I don't want to become an authoritarian political system that stifles debate, that uh, doesn't allow competing and dissenting views and ideas. Um, that's core of who we are and we should never change who we are to combat it. What we have to do is draw on those strengths and draw on our system as it is to respond. And so in the area of foreign interference, it's vitally important that we speak with one voice on the national stage and on the international arena. It's why the federal government passed the Foreign Relations Bill before Christmas last year, which gave the federal government the power to be in charge of Australia's foreign policy. Now, that sounds like something that most Australians would have thought was already the case that it seemed like a bit of an oversight that it wasn't already the case. But it was necessary because we had a situation, I'm sure we'll come to that soon, where a state government, in this case the Victorian Andrews government, thought that it could freelance on foreign policy, that it could establish its own international relations with the Chinese Communist Party in a way that was contradictory, not just to the federal government's policy, but the Federal Labor Party's policy, the bipartisan consensus at the national level that we shouldn't participate in a Belt and Road scheme. And we were being played off each other mm. and that internal division and weakness was being used against us. Well, the good news is we have addressed that, we have closed that loophole and that won't happen anymore. Well, that, that's fantastic. And look, I spend a lot of time on this program uh, having a go at Scott Morrison for not doing enough for freedom and for all the things I want and so on, but I have to give him his dues for acting on Belt and Road. You know, my views on Belt and Road, the, the fact that the the, the Andrews government is turning, you know, cash-strapped and turning to communist China for a dubious source of funds. To me, it's like a modern-day Kemlani loans affair, and that's bad enough. Mm -hmm. But speaking as the chair of the uh, Intelligence and Security Committee and with everything you're privy to that you're comfortable sharing with uh, my audience, of course, as well, um, what was baked into the detail of that bill and mm -hmm. what, what parts of our sovereignty will we effectively selling off uh, for that proverbial can of soybeans? Well, there's kind of two distinct categories of harm that Victoria's participation in the Belt and Road Agreement did. The first is simply by participating in the agreement, they undermined national consensus and sent the message to the world and the Chinese Communist Party that we were internally divided and that that could be used against us. So inherently, I think if a state government takes a position on foreign policy, contrary to the federal government's position, that is dangerous in and of itself, and that loophole should be closed off for that reason alone. But there are other dangers uh, with participating in the Belt and Road Scheme. The Belt and Road Scheme is designed to promote China's strategic influence around the world, but particularly in our region. Now, if we had friendlier relations with China than we do today, even if we had a benign relationship with China, uh, than we do compared to what we have today, then that might not necessarily be a problem. But by definition, when you have a foreign government which is waging a campaign of economic coercion against us, which is perpetuating political influence against us, then we're engaged in a zero-sum game with them for influence. Mm. And anything which promotes their influence, particularly in our region, comes at the expense of our influence and therefore is harmful. And what Daniel Andrews, I hope, unwittingly did was to hand them an enormous propaganda victory that they could use, for example, in the Pacific mm. to say that while the Australian government might urge you to be cautious and to consider carefully your national interest in signing up to the Belt and Road Agreement, the Victorian government participates in the Belt and Road Agreement, so how harmful can it be? And if that made the Belt and Road uh, Agreement's uh, task easier in the Pacific, then it by definition weakened our national interests and weakened our security. And so it was very harmful for that reason and it's very important it was cancelled for that reason. And the other thing that bothers me is the debt trap diplomacy idea, the idea that you know the Chinese government has funded very critical infrastructure projects, foreclosed on those debts and now effectively owns you know, ports in Africa, in Sri Lanka, in key strategic areas. How badly 
has the damage been done so far? Can, can the horse really be put back in the pen now that it's bolted? Well, I'm concerned about those uh, instances of debt trap diplomacy that have occurred, and the Sri Lankan court is one of those examples, mm. one of those apparent examples. But well, I'm also concerned about the way in which the Belt and Road Agreement has been used as a vector for corruption and influence peddling. Uh, when these projects get up with Chinese finance, there is often strings attached to them that, for example, Chinese construction firms must deliver them. Uh, and it's not unknown, particularly in the developing world where there's less robust rule of law, that mm -hmm. officials and politicians and others are bought off uh, as a result of these infrastructure projects. So not only is there that overt soft power influence being uh, bought by building these infrastructure uh, projects and saying, look, China's delivered this. But there is a covert element of influence building that can go on there when officials and others are bought off and co-opted uh, to the aims of the Chinese state. So um, it is particularly detrimental to Australia's interests when that occurs in our own region. And that's why we urge our, our friends and partners in the Pacific to think very, very carefully about whether it is in their national interest, very carefully about whether it is a good deal, very carefully about whether the infrastructure will be high quality and whether or not they can pay it back. Well, look, I'm just going to say it. I think the threat posed by China broadly, I think, is the greatest geopolitical uh, challenge to the free world since uh, Nazi Germany. Um, but what that shows us, as history does every time, is that freedom does defeat the forces of state coercion. That's not just because freedom wins, it is because central planning fails. Now, when you look at China, they've got vulnerabilities just like the West have. They have, got de they have demographic issues posed by the one-child policy. They have as much debt as we do, if not more. Uh, and, and again, I make the point, central planning, especially on as monstrous a level of the, as the Chinese have done it, fails every single time. So how optimistic are you of the Chinese project such as it is coming undone, at least in our lifetime? I'm optimistic for a couple of reasons, Gideon. One is the issues that you alluded to. Uh, everyone marvels at the economic growth that China has uh, achieved in recent years. And that is a profoundly positive thing for the Chinese people. It's lifted hundreds of millions of people out mm. of poverty. That's a good thing. But China has to grow quickly quickly because if they don't grow quickly, they'll actually fall backwards. And that's because of the ageing population that you refer yeah. to, which stems directly from the one-child policy that they practised for many years that has started to be unpicked, but probably too late. China has to get rich before it gets old. Otherwise, it will, it will engage in a, in a stagnation and it won't grow. It'll fall into that middle income trap yeah. and it will never get to match the West on per capita income uh, and prosperity. And that's dangerous for the Chinese Communist Party because it derives in part its uh, authority to govern and its consent with the people, informal as it is, uh, mm. from that ongoing growth. So if Chinese growth drops by more than, say, the five and a half, six percent that it's achieved in recent years, uh, then the prosperity of individual Chinese citizens and families will go backwards, not forwards, because there are so many workers leaving the workforce and very few uh, graduating into the workforce to replace them. So that's a diabolical challenge that they have, which they haven't yet overcome. And that, I think, will temper uh, their growth and their strength. But undeniably, they will still be a powerful country in our region, in the world. The other reason, though, why I'm optimistic, Gideon, is that the Chinese Communist Party has helped organise the free world better than we could ever organise ourselves with their <laughs> behaviour over the last couple of years. Uh, I'm part of an organisation called the Interparliamentary Alliance on China. It now has more than 20 parliaments as members and criteria for mem membership is you must be a liberal democracy yeah. and you must have a centre-left and centre-right co-chair willing to serve uh, on, on the board. And I, I'm a co-chair for Australia with uh, Labor Senator Kimberly Kitching and there are hundreds of individual parliamentarians all around Europe and Asia and North America who are members now. We're very closely coordinating with each other and we're having great influence in our own countries on changing the debate on these issues. And we're demonstrating enormous solidarity with each other uh, which is crucial when facing a much bigger opponent, in this case, China. or Any one of us on our own, of course, uh, is in a much weaker position. But collectively, when we act together, uh, we're in a very strong position to defend our interests and defend our values, and that's a really positive development. Yeah, and look, one area I, th I think we're not in complete agreement on is the match fitness of the United States, such as it currently is, to stand up to China. I think we, with, with Donald Trump uh, in the White House, there was uh, nobody would, would mess with the US and the Western world. They knew that he was too crazy to to be trifled with. To me, to extend my sort of you know interwar period metaphor, I would I would say that Biden to me is more of a, a von Hindenburg type figure. This old past, you know, vaguely statesman like uh, you know useless. Uh, idiot. Um, your view, though, is that if you look at the underlying administration, 
uh, we can at least trust the Biden administration on the critical issue of China. I, I should preface this by saying there'd be many disagreements I would have with uh, the Biden administration and the Democratic Party on domestic policy mm. issues, uh, but that's a matter for them how they want to run their own country. Yep. What I'm really interested in is their foreign policy, their defence policy and their intelligence and security policy. And on that front, the early signs are encouraging. Uh, there is no stronger bipartisan consensus in Washington than on China. Yep. I travelled to the United States a couple of years ago, and from the most liberal Democrats to the most conservative Republicans, there was amazing consensus on how the United States needed to step up and stand up for its values and its interests in the world, and that's a profoundly positive thing. And from the Biden administration, if you look at the early appointments that they made, um, they basically went around and scoured the country for the Democrats who were the most sceptical of the Chinese Communist mm. Party, and they appointed them to the key portfolios in the defence foreign affairs space. Um, so if you look at people like Tony Blinken or Kurt Campbell or Jake Sullivan or others, they are the Democrats who've been most outspoken in the last four years when they're out of office about the need for the Democratic Party and the United States to muscle up to China. So I was encouraged by that. I was also encouraged by the meeting in Anchorage. The, the list of uh, concerns that the US side, yes, absolutely, the list of concerns that the US side outlined uh, with the Chinese side were exactly the same concerns that Australia has, whether it's human rights abuses in Hong Kong and Xinjiang, whether it's uh, aggression towards Taiwan, militarisation of the South China Sea, and crucially, the economic coercion of allies. That was immensely encouraging. And finally, Kurt Campbell is the uh, Asia czar for the Biden administration. He's Mr Asia. He's the go-to guy on Asia policy. He publicly said about a month ago that a precondition of an improved US-China relationship was that China stopped economically coercing Australia. Mm. Now, as strong as a, as the Trump administration was on China, no Trump administration official said anything, anything anywhere near that publicly and clearly about how what is happening to Australia is unacceptable. And I think that is a profoundly encouraging sign. Now, of course, it's early days uh, and it's, we, it, we watched with great interest, but uh, I'm encouraged. Well, look, that all sounds very encouraging to me. I'll keep an open mind, Ree, Tony Blinkett. I mean, Mike Pompeo, he ain't, but uh, we will see what happens there. But look, in the meantime, maybe maybe the external threat of China is what the Western world and the free world needs to get a bit of gumption and get its act together. You know, who knows? This might uh, end up being like the glorious post-war era that we had in the 1950s and beyond. But in the meantime, to you, Senator Patterson, thank you so much for the work you do on this very, very important issue. Thank you for actually keeping us safe as opposed to other politicians supporting to keep us safe in various ways. And uh, I'm sure we will talk again on this very, very important and existential issue. Thank you, Gideon, and thank you and all your colleagues at the IPA for the very important voice that you provide in public debate. Australia would be much poorer, much less free if we didn't have the IPA out there fighting every day. So thank you. Thank you, Senator.